G'day everyone. Um, my name's David Pope. I'm a political cartoonist. Um, I don't have. I feel a bit daunted about uh, talking to everyone today about copyright. I don't have the, any sort of legal background or um, you know, understanding of the complexities. So having read through a few of the submissions to the ALRC's uh, um, inquiry and it, reading its uh, its issues paper, um, I just sort of boggled a bit about how some of those questions are going to be resolved. Um, but that's your job, really. I'm just going to share perhaps uh, what my <coughs> practice is um, as, a, as a person who creates uh, images for a living, um, a living that's uh, less and less secure, I think, and, and that may actually disappear in the next <laughs> short period. Um, and uh, my experience is pre and post sort of the digital age and what some of the things I've seen about how co copyright works and, and things we need to perhaps take into account in the future. Um, so I've been drawing um, political cartoons, or well, cartoons since uh, since the mid 1980s, and it started out as uh, just um, something of interest. Uh, it, it was driven by a desire to have political expression. It wasn't uh, driven out of a desire to build a career or, or a job, but it eventually became that through a long process where people eventually started asking to uh, reprint my work in publications and being prepared to pay for it and having an expectation that they would pay for it and me developing more confidence in myself to know that they should be uh, paying for it because they were paying everybody else involved in, in the publishing business. You know, the journalists were getting paid, the printers were getting paid um, and then trying to sort of establish the fact that if, art, if you want to use the artwork in your publications, the artist should be getting paid as well. Um, and so that turned into a sort of uh, part-time job and eventually um, became a full-time job uh, as a freelancer, and interestingly now I've, I've become a salaried cartoonist where the copyright is owned by um, my employer for the last five years, and in a, in a business model and an industry which is um, one of the latest comers to having to, to, to realise that the business, old business model is not going to work and you've, you've got to change direction. And uh, my experience in Australia probably lags a few years behind the US experience where uh, the number of cartoonists who work on newspapers in the US has shrunk, I think it was something like, you know, it was more than a thousand cartoonists in, in, at the turn of the 19th, the turn of the 20th century, not in uh, sort of uh, 1900. There's about a thousand cartoonists working in U US papers across the country. And then that shrunk to about uh, probably a, a hundred working in newspapers as staff artists in, in uh, at the start of this uh, millennium, and it's shrunk now to about 40, about a decade later. And so there's a huge tide of change happening for cartoonists in the US who are having to move back to the sort of freelance life that I was used to um, uh, existing on before I became a staff cartoonist uh, in a digital age where people uh, expect to pay less for, for sort of content now. And, and so look, cartoonists are now faced with layoffs. A lot of young cartoonists have given up um, trying to make a living. Others are trying all the different sort of models that we've been touched on today, uh, trying to find ways to uh, to earn to earn money. So um, the US experience is quite a good, actually there's quite a good, uh, if you're interested, there's quite a good um, issues paper written by the Hair Block uh, Foundation, which is a, a foundation set up uh, um, in memory of a New York cartoonist, uh, Hair Block. And uh, it was two years ago, they wrote a report. I, I'll, if, if you're interested, I can get the details later. The Golden Age for Editorial Cartoonists of the Nation's Newspapers is Over was the title of it. It had 11 short essays from cartoonists about how they were making the transition to the digital age. And it's a story of layoffs, of people having to work twice as hard, trying um, to add new strings to their bow through podcasts and merchandise, some of the stuff that we saw in the last session there. Um, uh, speaking engagements, all sorts of things to um, continue to earn a living from it. Um, and a couple of the models that uh, are being tried now, I think, uh, illustrate the really positive things about the web, um, which I, I guess I should touch on. So before, before I, uh, when I started out, pre-digital, I was drawing on bits of paper, I was photocopying things to send to editors, they were going into the I was going to a post office and posting them off. And the digital era just completely transformed the way I work in terms of being able to um, send material to editors more sort of instantly. 
um, to find picture references even for, for drawings and things like that. Um, it transformed the way I work and the way I related to editors at the same time as destroying the, the business models for the publishers that, that were using my work. But the, the biggest change is that it enables a direct relationship with readers and uh, with your audience. And that's something that, that uh, cartoonists and other creators are, are still trying to, um, to work out uh, and, and to negotiate. So I know a couple of cartoonists in the US are trying to direct subscription models to sustain their practice by uh, encouraging readers to um, subscribe for a year and that they will get sort of instant access to the work as it's produced. Others are trying the sort of crowdsourcing techniques through Possible and Kickstarter where um, projects can be put up um, ahead of time and you can get the money if you're wanting to produce an ebook, for example, getting the money ahead of time rather than being uh, at the vagaries of the market at the other end of the production process. Um, all of this is a work in progress. It is a Wild West sort of frontier, as someone mentioned earlier, and uh, what's going to work and what won't, uh, we'll just, uh, I guess we're still learning. Um, newspapers, as I said, have been perhaps the, one of the last businesses to come to terms with the internet and the digital age. I, I remember a senior manager saying, not three years ago, the internet was the enemy of newspapers, and it just seems sort of just a bizarre idea that somehow you could uh, set yourself against the internet and hope that your model, your publishing model would hold up. Um, and what that's meant now is that for an organisation that I work in, Fairfax, which has made a 180 degree about face <laughs> uh, by necessity um, to work out how it's going to exist in the digital age. And, uh, and it's going through a huge restructuring process now as a result. And, um, and that's changing, and that's changing, uh, that's changing my work day and my workflow um, quite dramatically. Um, so, in terms of copyright, I guess that leads to my uh, perhaps my experience of the digital age. Then, what what are my expectations of um, copyright as someone who creates work? And uh, I do have an expectation that my work will get shared online, and um, and I accept a pretty broad notion of fair use. And I can't really even track how it gets shared. Uh, I mean, there's some tools uh, on Google where I can um, see how an image has travelled and being used on blogs. But uh, often on Facebook and uh, so other social networks, it's, it's very difficult to see. But I know stuff gets wild, widely um, distributed. And I expect that. I expect that. I, I don't think that's something I can hold back. It, uh, it's, it's not something I think we should try and stop. I think the, sh the sharing environment on, online is uh, an example of, um, of people participating in culture. The culture is, not, culture is not something produced by a caste to be consumed by, by a mass. Culture is something that we all participate in and uh, that we all create. And in, in the act of sharing um, the things that we find online that we appreciate, um, people are creating culture as much as... Uh, um, um, consuming it. Um, there are so I accept that stuff's going to get shared, and I don't accept, I don't expect to try and chase down people who use it without permission. I think, you know, you just have to, you just have to wear that. I guess where there are egregious violations because people are using it for commercial gain. I mean, that's where I would draw the line. And as I've sheltered behind copyrights as a creator in the pre-digital age, I would hope that. Um, copyrights might uh, protect creators in the post-digital age from that sort of um, commercial exploitation of their work. Um, I've always, I, but I've always had a problematic approach to copyright. It always seems to me uh, a sort of bizarre thing, for example, that um, you know, the copyrights to Beatles songs or the songs of your favourite recording artist could be sort of separated from the person who created, created the work and become a property right that capitalism can trade and can be transferred to someone else who had as much to do with the production of this cultural work as someone in their garage band who wants to play the song themselves. And, um, and the fact that we've had to invent this sort of moral rights, to, to this whole idea of moral rights, because copyrights has basically fallen down to, uh, in that regard. Um, so I've always found that uh, copyrights quite problematic. Um, I guess online I do expect uh, acknowledgement or attribution where sharing occurs. And I think there's, 
Um, that's all. That's all being sort of negotiated now online and being shaken out. And I would hope, I would hope any reform of copyright laws uh, has to basically has to move to where people are, and it has to recognise the practice that people are actually engaged in. Um, and it has to do that if it has any hope of also playing a leading role to educate people about what what is appropriate, what 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 are the sort of etiquettes that we would like to see about sharing content online, um, because I think there are ones that we'd like to see. And this came out to me, uh, there was a, a case involving uh, a cartoonist, Matthew Inman, who writes a pretty, pretty popular webcomic called The Oatmeal. And he was finding his work was being hoovered up by a, a, an aggregate website called Funny Junk and just being republished there without attribution. And in fact, the attribution was actually stripped out of his cartoons, so it was just um, being reposted. And he complained about it, but he didn't take any legal approach to doing it, uh, to trying to seek redress. He approached them and said, can you take this material down? Um, you know, it's not linking back to my site. It's not giving me the um, credit for the work that I've produced. And, uh, and he made, he made uh, dis disparaging comments about this, this model on his blog and received a, um, a cease and desist notice himself from the lawyers of this, <laughs> from this uh, funny junk website who, who uh, sought $20,000 in damages for defamation. And, uh, and his approach was not to take a legal approach. His approach was to, um, to basically flip them the, the middle finger and uh, said he would um, raise $20,000 online and give it to a charity uh, and then draw a picture of uh, Funny Junk's mother uh, seducing a bear. And, um, and that was going to be his response. And, through his network, he raised the twenty thousand dollars in sixty-four minutes, and um, and it, it, it and it led to a bit of a war between the, the supporters of the sort of web users of Funny Junk, who are you know, young people who are used to being able to access this stuff whenever they want, and, and you know they want to be able to post stuff up where they wherever they find it and share it, and um, and then the fans of Oatmeal who see that this this person who they want to support that they're you know they're not getting the credit that's due, and uh, you know this isn't right, this isn't fair. And, and through that process, uh, I think, you know, th those sort of actions are, are how the new etiquette is going to be established. Um, uh, in the end, Matthew Inman, I think he raised $200,000. He withdrew it uh, in $20 bills from the bank. And a line, he did a whole comic on this. You should look it up. It's quite funny. And he took a photograph of the money spelling out, fuck you, and <laughs> posted it to Funny Junk, uh, posted the photo to Funny Junk and gave the, uh, the money to charities. Um, so uh, all of that's to say that you know, I, I want to see an etiquette develop around sharing and uh, attribution. And um, uh, I, could, no, I won't bother trying to find examples there. Um, and then how did, so then the last thing, I, I, we're probably running out of time. Perhaps how do my expectations of, of copyright as a creator um, fit with my expectations as a consumer or as a citizen, I prefer to say, as some, as someone who accesses culture online and uh, likes to find content, and um, you know, and I, you know, I just—it seems like the story, everyone's stories, the stories are legion about our frustrations with the regime and with the, the ability to to share, to find content online and to find it legitimately, um, and uh, uh, you know, the, so this, the geo blocking stuff drives me insane. I had to find a. I had to find a, uh, I was trying to find a movie of As You Like It for my son to watch for his school, as part of a school project. And could I find a legitimate copy to rent online? And even, even the local video shop had a copy that they would sell you, they couldn't rent it, they'd sell it to you and it was a European region. I couldn't even play it on our um, player. Um, the fact that they would sell a multi-region DVD here speaks volumes about how stupid the law is. And uh, uh, there was no way we could legitimately um, there was a copy for rent from the UK which we weren't able to access. So there was no way we could legitimately access that. Um, and as a, as a citizen I, and as a creator, I expect to, to, to pay to support content creation. I'm quite willing to do that. And the thing I find most um, interesting, exciting about the web is that there is the possibility for uh, a direct relationship with your audience. And I guess like a farmer's market where I, you know, try and... It's great to have a direct relationship with the people who produce your food. Um, if, if there's music I like or books or artwork, I like to try and buy it directly from the, the artist if possible and increasingly the, the technology is making that possible. 
I would love to, uh, and in some ways, uh, echoing what Kate was saying, the barriers I find to online are not so much um, copyright barriers, but uh, just some technological ones. I'd love to see a really good micropayment system develop on the web, which would allow people like a tip system, and that's starting to develop with sites like Flatter, where you know you can, when you find content you like, you can immediately tip the the creator of it as a sort of um, as a contribution. Um, and you see that with PayPal, the things aren't quite seamless yet. I know a lot of software developers and open source developers uh, um, use a sort of donation model through PayPal. But that's something that I, I'd like to see develop. And, and the fact that I can, I mean, if I can avoid Amazon, if I can avoid iTunes, if I can avoid Google Play and, 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 and uh, support an artist directly uh, for the content that I value, then you know, that's, that's the way I want to go. But I expect easier ways to pay for that content online. Um, so, and I expect that there should remain ways for that content to remain free. And there's got to be a huge, you know, this content has to be free because uh, in, uh, in one form, because not everyone has the capacity to pay. And we keep talking, I mean, this whole debate about, we talk about creators and consumers and we're citizens and not every, you know, we live in a market economy and not everyone has access to uh, uh, the, the the resources to, to buy, the, buy their way into the culture. You shouldn't have to buy your way into the culture. Uh, so I'd like to see libraries and, and um, sort of public domain sources supported in, uh, in providing that open access to people. And, and I guess, you know, work, oh, perhaps finishing off, working in the, in the media and seeing how journalism, for example, is so tied to this particular business model, the print business model, which is now going down the drain. Um, and I think the, the existing media companies will make the jump um, um, to cyberspace, but they'll do it much smaller and will be paying for a lot less, will be less able to pay for the sort of journalism they've paid for in the past. And I think that raises the question about, you know, we, if once we separate out journalism from the business model, how are we going to get that journalism that uh, uh, democracy and a public culture requires? And I think there's a role, for example, for public um, provision, you know, just as we expect the ABC, SBS, public support for those services to help fill the gap that the market doesn't uh, fill. Um, I, I recognise the importance of public arts grants, for example, to uh, support, say, artists in an industry, for example, where I work, where we no longer take on young artists to work in newspapers to learn those graphic skills. And, um, and, and I'm, I shouldn't be negative about the, the graphic field I work in. Political cartooning is uh, on shaky ground, but the graphic arts as a whole on the web have exploded, um, just as alternative music sort of exploded with community radio in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, the web has provided th this opportunity for graphic arts to broaden substantially. And, um, but it, I think uh, for artists to actually earn money to be able to sustain the practice, and. Practice takes time, and uh, good arts practice requires uh, people to devote time to it. And if we want that to happen, we're going to have to find ways to, to pay for it. I'll leave it there. I haven't showed anything. I, I haven't shown anything. <laughs> I was, um, was going to show a little video of... Uh, I, the last thing I will say, I, I draw everything digitally now. There's no paper involved. The original artwork no longer exists. It's only a computer file. And um, so that's also a, a complete change. We can, no, I can no longer sell an original as a special art of, cultural artefact.